Joining me now is Edward Said, a scholar and professor of English at Columbia University. He's also a member of the Palestinian National Council, Palestine's parliament in exile, and speaks out often on issues affecting Arabs. He was born in Palestinian Jerusalem and educated in Cairo and the U.S. Dr. Said, in what important ways are Arabs different from the stereotypes we heard about? Well, I think the first thing is that Arabs are fantastically diverse. I mean, there are many different kinds of Arabs. I mean, a Syrian is very different from a Moroccan. Uh, there are regional accents. There are traditions completely local to various parts of the Arab world. Uh, traditions of dress, of cuisine, of accent, of dialect, uh, of history. I think that's the most important thing, to think of Arabs as just one large group of screaming fanatics who are practically faceless is, I think, the first uh, myth that has to be set against the reality. The second one is that it is, a, and this is the most important to me, uh, difference between the cliché and the reality, is that the Arabs are the inheritors of an extraordinary civilization, one that stretches back now uh, in, its, in its modern forms for about a millennium and a half. There is a, first of all, there's the language. The Arabic language is one of the, in my opinion, one of the most extraordinary uh, constructions of the human mind. Language of poetry. It's a language of poetry, yeah. it's a language of mysticism and theology, it's a language of law, it's a language of extraordinary humor, for example, and na narration. I mean, some of the great feats of narrative skill, the Arabian Nights, uh, the travels of Ibn Battuta, etc., are written in Arabic. So there's that. There's al it's also one of the great religions of the world, which is in Arabic. I mean, the, the Quran is the word of God in the Arabic language. And this tradition encompasses such things, not only of the learned traditions that we've just mentioned, but architecture. City planning. I mean, for example, the city of Baghdad was considered one of the great summits of Arab art because of the structure, the circular structure of the city, and the way it was constructed with fountains and water. And then the range in geography is fantastic. You have the great civilization of the uh, of the uh, 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 of the fertile plains like uh, Syria and Iraq, and then you have the Andalusian civilization of the Arabs in southern Spain, uh, really up to the center of Spain. And then you have an entirely different kind of sort of hybrid Arab civilization in North Africa, mingling with, uh, you know, southern uh, African uh, uh, art and tradition and, and, and customs with Islam. And then you have Egypt, which is a sui generis kind of a combination of Arab and pharaonic civilizations. And above all, in all of this, there is the diversity of many different uh, not only uh, races, if you like, but also different religions and cultures. That a lot the of sects. A lot of sects, yeah. a lot of sects. But for example, I happen to come from a Christian minority in the Arab world, which is, there are Christians throughout the Arab world, and right. we consider ourselves Arabs. And even our civilization is Islamic, uh, that, that, that it's a rich enough civilization to make place for all. The idea of separation between uh, Arabs and the rest of the world is a relatively modern idea. Then how do you account for this? Uh obvious stereotype that has come across to us in all of the movies and television programs and literature that Jack Shaheen and Jim Agarath yes. were talking about. Well, I think about. it's a problem you need, I think one has to analyze it not as a problem of the Arabs, but a problem of, of our society, of the United States, which, which has packaged people, has had no long tradition, for example, Britain and France uh, have had much dealings right. in the Arab world, and there are cliches there too, I mean, there are, you know, racist portraits of Arabs that you find in Britain and France. But there is also another tradition, which is long residence and encounter, mostly colonial. Uh, the Brit British and the French ruled the Arab world for, for many decades. So there's at least the knowledge, the intimate sense of what the Arab people are like as a people. In the United States, we don't have that. We don't have long, a long encounter or residence. We're relatively newcomers to this world, and we tend to see it in terms of packages, in terms of quick images, sound bites, the entertainment culture. Entertainment, really entertainment, and above culture. all politics, a very dehumanizing kind of politics in which Arabs are seen essentially in this country as enemies of Israel and fanatics of one sort or another. And, and that, of course, has nothing to do with it. But I was struck the other day during the Persian Gulf crisis by yes. a piece you wrote in the uh, New York Times magazine in which you referred to a remorseful propensity to violence yes. embedded in uh, the Arab culture. Well, I was talking about contemporary political culture, that is to say, we have had in the 20th century 
a series of periods. For example, the period between World War I and World War II was essentially a period, and as we look back on it now, of liberal democracies, you know, mostly monarchies of one sort or another, that took up from where the British and the French had left off. And there was a, a great deal of building in, the, in that period. You know, universities were right. built, schools were made available to large numbers of people, and, and the general somnolence of the Ottoman period before World War I was, was coming to an end. After World War II, when the United States came into the region and the, and the British and the French had terminally left, with the founding of Israel, we, we get a new kind of culture which is based upon militant nationalism, which is the nationalism of the third world. Meaning the one party state. nationalism meaning my country right or exactly, wrong. Exactly, exactly. You see, and, 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 the, and the one party state. Uh, the, the military state, government, military government uh, people defending the security of the Arab nation and, and using the rhetoric of Arab nationalism, which is a grand and marvelous thing in cultural terms, but it's used in these ways of which Saddam Hussein is a pathological symptom, you see. But there are similar governments like that now. Now that culture has in effect marginalized many of the great writers, the great artists of the who are still writing. And what instead you have are these national security states which are abusers of human rights, you see, in the Arab world. But that's not the whole Arab world, you see. That's just the governments with which we do business, whereas the, the largeness of Arab life with the 200 million people that we've been speaking about goes on. I was saddened by something else you wrote, which I realized when I re read it was true, that yes. I had experienced but hadn't thought about it. You referred to the fact that during the colonial period when the Europeans were, well, earlier in this century, you could travel from uh, Syria to Egypt yes. uh, without any kind well, of... Well, I did it in my own life. <laughs> but today, <laughs> every, country every country has a border exactly. that has to be... Exactly. And we're living through this new kind of nationalism, which is widespread in the, in the world generally, where boundaries and, and the separations between people... For example, the idea that there should be a wholly homogenous Syrian state or Israeli state or Lebanese state is really not part of the history and culture of that part of the world. The Romans, for example, ruled what is now the Arab yeah. world as one large country with different races living together. And I think that's a much healthier attitude. And I, my feeling is that it still persists. For example, a great Syrian poet, uh, Nizal Qabbani, is the most popular poet in the Arab world, read everywhere from Morocco right through to the Gulf. The language is that of all the Arabs. There's a lingua franca, which is amazingly alive, and a literature that goes along with it. There's a political culture uh, not of individual countries, but of Arabism, of the sense of a nation and of a people, which is tremendously important to every Arab, despite these divisions that are now uh, plaguing our, you know, our contemporary reality. And that is unknown in this country. You're really fascinated with that language, aren't you? No, As a writer, you're a <laughs> professor. Well, it's, it's, it's not only a rich language, it's been so much maligned, you know, because m it's, it's considered to be a very difficult language. In fact, it's not. Uh, but it's characterized, it's interesting, a lot of the attacks and the cultural attacks on the Arabs focus on the language that's considered to be a language of violence, of bombast, of, of, uh, of sort of awful portentousness. It isn't, in fact. It's a very flexible, athletic language. From athletic? Which the, athletic. Oh, fantastic. It many, so. many, can do many things. Many, many things. Greek. It, uh, it, exactly. Most of, the great, most of the great classics of the Greeks came, uh, the, the scientific classics, the logical classics, the works of Aristotle, came to the West through Arabic translations. I mean, that's how they were known. So that sense of the language unites us, because it's a language of religion, it's a language of everyday life, it's a language of, uh, of, of, of courtship, it's a language of society, and its possibilities are as many as the Arabs are many. Many of those great uh, romantic, if not erotic, poems came out of that uh, a certain Arabic uh, style and tradition. Yes, but not only that. I mean, that has a certain kind of... Um, uh, st um, stylized thing. Right. But if you look, for example, one of the great creations of the 20th century is the Arabic novel. I mean, Nagib Mahfouz, who won the Nobel Prize for literature in 1988, writes in Arabic that is particular to him because he's an Egyptian writing out of a particular quarter in Cairo. But it is intelligible to, for example, a, a reader in the Sudan or a reader in Baghdad. And each of these countries has produced its own literature which reflects the architecture, the design of the city, the customs and the traditions of the past, the, for example, the relationship between a certain religious tradition that is unique to the Sudan or to uh, Iraq or to uh, Egypt. Th those things are very much part of the life, the everyday life of the and they're completely hidden, you see, from the American to the American uh, are, public. Are politics and nationalism going to um, be the ultimate uh, undoing of this great civilization? Well, I don't think so. No, I, no. I think one has to take the long view. Uh, it's a civilization that has had many peaks, uh, many heights, 
uh, some would argue that we are at a, at a perhaps a low point now in, in, in the 20th century. I myself am not sure of that. I think politically there is a division now between the rulers of the Arab world, who are really a handful of, of men effectively, and the people, where a great deal of skill and competence in modernization. I mean, you know, after all, uh, in, in my lifetime, when I l left Cairo in the early 60s, uh, it was a city of three million. It's now a city of 15 million, and it supports these people with astonishing, I mean, it's crowded and, and dusty and so on, but there are tremendous changes occurring in the Arab world, and I think to look at them just from this perspective of the moment and the present despair that a lot of us feel at, at this terrible war is, I think, not, not the way to look at it. What do you most appreciate about your Arab past? Well, I think precisely that, that there is an Arab past and a people to which one can point and see these tremendous achievements in, in I, I think, cultural uh, is, is the main thing. This, this great culture of, of philosophy, of literature, of, uh, of uh, indeed, of daily life. There is something about Arab life on the, on the level of minute by minute that has a certain aesthetic to it. The relationships between members of a family, for example, is quite unique to the Arab world. It doesn't exist in this country where we think of the unit uh, of the, the, the nuclear family. Well, the kinship, there's a kinship, strong bond exactly. of kinship. And the complexity yeah. of it. The Arab mind is capable, of, I mean, I hate to use the phrase, but the, the Arab mind is capable of tremendous complexity of r human relationships. Uh, relationships between members of a family, members of a clan, members of a society, members of guilds with each other. The, the Arab guilds of the, of the Middle Age continued into the, into the 20th century. So like all the rest of us, the quote, Arab world is uh, many worlds. It's many worlds, one. exactly. Large and small. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Edward Said of Columbia University. Over the next four programs, we'll be talking about some of these issues in greater depth. The culture, the religion, the language, the humor, the economics of the Arab world. I'm Bill Moyers.